No, that's okay, so I am again happy to uh, introduce to you Vesna and Florian. They are from RIPE NCC. And today, as you see, they will tell us some new developments on the address policy and the community tools. Stage is yours. Hi. Well, this was a pre preliminary title, so some of you might find this not uh, as uh, exciting as, as the previous talk, but actually what uh, most of you always surely wanted to know and uh, were curious about is what is new with uh, RIPE. And uh, we have 60 slides and only 30 minutes, so I'm going to speak really fast. No. <laughs> Actually, we are going to cover just three major topics. Uh, why is it important to take part in the policy development, uh, routing information service, and very briefly, RIPE Atlas. So, I'm Vesna. I'm Florian. Uh, I'm a community builder at uh, RIPE NCC. Uh, I work in the uh, global information uh, infrastructure team. Uh, we run uh, things like uh, the uh, KRoot name server and the auth DNS cluster, also the uh, routing information uh, service, and uh, sometimes the boss makes me touch Hadoop for the uh, Atlas backend storage. So we'll be taking turns, and uh, I'll be uh, the, the first one, hopefully less than 10 minutes, uh, telling you uh, how can you change the addressing policies. Well, why is this even important? Well, the addressing policies of RIPE actually influence how do you run your business if you need IP addresses, either a business or maybe your hobby project. So, how are these uh, addresses in general distributed? Well, it's a hierarchical system and there are five regional internet registries, uh, one for every continent and in Europe, that is RIPE NCC. So, how many of you know the difference between RIPE and RIPE NCC? Let me see a show of hands. Okay, I won't be happy until all of you actually raise your hands. So this is one of my minor missions in life to, in, to, to teach you what is the difference between RIPE and RIPE NCC. Well, the first giveaway is the name. Uh, it's completely different. One is RIPE, which stands for Réseau IP European, pardon my French. The other one is RIPE NCC, which stands for RIPE Network, uh, NCC? <laughs> <laughs> Network Communication Cent uh, coordination center. Sorry, I don't even know it myself. How can I expect from you to know it? So anyway, there are actually three major differences. RIPE is a community. So basically, all of you are RIPE. RIPE NCC, on the other hand, is a company. It's a not-for-profit membership association where we work for. RIPE, that is you, develops these addressing policies. So there are policy proposals, there are discussions, and in the end, there is a consensus. RIPE NCC, on the other hand, implements those policies. So we distribute address space. And then finally, in the end, it goes back to you, to the ISPs, and then you have to deal with those policies in the day-to-day -day -day work. And uh, the third difference is RIPE community has two large meetings per year. Next year, they will be in Budapest and in Dubai. RIPE NCC, being a small organization, has at least two meetings per day. So these are the major differences. And uh, how else does RIPE work? Well, there are working groups for every topic. And... Uh, for example, address policy, DNS, routing, and then there is many more. And uh, as, uh, as you can see, there is also, um, well, some people that are grumpy and not very happy. And so all these discussions happen mostly at the right meetings, but also on the mailing list. And uh, the top secret working group that you see there sometimes uh, is also involved in some poetry and even singing. So you can uh, find the, the videos of their singing also on YouTube. So uh, these discussions happen on mailing lists. 
How many of you are subscribed to a mailing list? Ooh, this is great. Well, for the, the, some maybe friends of yours who don't really like mailing lists, we have a new thing. It's a ripe forum. It's a web forum where you can post and then those messages will actually end up on the mailing list. They will also end up in the web archive, so you can actually use the forum for reading the archives. And uh, while you're at it, you can also grab the popcorn, because sometimes those discussions tend to get heated, especially if the topics are like really um, close to people's hearts. So mostly, currently, these discussions are about IPv6, because this is one of the resources that we are now mostly distributing. How does it work? Again, it's hierarchical. So Ayana gives larger blocks to regional registries, then we give aggregatable blocks, so this provider aggregatable allocations to local internet registries, and then they give them to end users. And there is uh, some kind of strange address space, uh, PI, provider independent, and this is one of the most recent policies that has been proposed. How many of you have heard about this uh, policy proposal to change the PI assignments? Okay, so this is quite interesting because uh, it's a German guy who suggested it uh, from uh, Freifunk. And uh, I actually like uh, this policy. So if for nothing else, please go uh, to the address policy working group and give your opinion there because I would like this policy to change. Um, some people still want IPv4. Well, uh, I have bad news for you. It's not really new. There is no more IPv4. It's exhausted. It's gone. The, there are, like we are uh, scraping the barrel, there is still one little block of 1,024 addresses for every uh, LIR, local internet registry. And uh, apart from that, there are transfers. So you can transfer addresses from one company to the other. There are all kinds of uh, rules and uh, regulations about that in our PDFs that are going to be published. There are a lot of more information and links about this. And the very important thing for RIPNCC is that you register the uh, correct contact details in the WHOIS database after the transfer. So these policies are cyclical. So who can change the policies? You can change the policies. They are yours. They are ripe policies, and please take part in them. Actually, I'm preaching to the converted here because most of the people who have been taking part in the policy discussions actually come from Germany. So, congratulations. You're very active. Who uh, here is not from Germany? Can I see a show of hands? Ah. You people go home and take part so that your country is also going to shine next time when we have this uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, we will take questions afterwards. And uh, this is the end of the, the first part. Okay, so uh, about the um, routing information uh, um, service, uh, we have a, a worldwide uh, network of uh, BGP uh, collectors. Uh, we have them deployed at uh, internet exchanges, and there we collect uh, BGP data. Uh, when I looked up this number last week, we had um, nearly 700 peers uh, at 18 locations, and uh, around about 150 uh, full tables. Uh, and uh, most importantly, I think, uh, we have uh, over 15 years of history. Um, so we have um, the collectors in these locations. It's a bit uh, European-centric, uh, but we are particularly uh, proud of uh, some of the uh, new ones, for example, in, uh, uh, in South Africa. Um, this is uh, the um, historic overview. So the first one uh, we had uh, in 1999 uh, is in Amsterdam, and um, some got uh, decommissioned. And the interesting ones, or the the, the, the new stuff, is uh, starting with RC uh, 18 uh, to 21. We're calling them the uh, new style RCs, uh, but more to, uh, on that later. So I said we. Um, 
Collect all the data, so you can get the raw data, uh, more than 15 years uh, worth, at um, the, that URL there. Um, we also have a, a web interface, and uh, we provide an API, and the web interface actually uses that API. So uh, there's a good chance that the API actually works. Um, so here's an example for um, the uh, RipeSide web interface. Um, you, um, if you're looking at the uh, uh, routing uh, uh, status, you um, end up here with the first overview. And uh, turns out uh, AS8365 uh, has some uh, v6 uh, visibility problems. It's quite visible um, for v4, but there's some trouble with v6. Um, and we can uh, dig into. Um, it turns out something is going on in uh, Milan and in uh, Paris. Not all the uh, peers um, give out the uh, full prefixes. Maybe worth uh, looking into, if you care about V6. Not quite sure if it will ever catch on. Um, here's another thing that you can use for, for monitoring. So this updates, um, or you can set it to uh, update once a new data comes in. And you can see the um, announcement and withdrawals, uh, the frequency of those. Um, however, the trouble with this is this is the uh, um, old style data, so we have uh, quite a delay on this on the order of hours. Um, with the new style RCs, uh, we can do something nicer. We can uh, stream data to you, and uh, we have a demo for that. Um, this uses um, web sockets, and um, to be stream uh, JSON data. And in the, in the first column, the uh, RC time, that's the time when this data was collected, and um, the delay is calculated on the web browser. So we have a, a delay of uh, 0 0.1 uh, seconds here. Um, for the first message, which came from um, RC21, which is in um, Zurich. So uh, it took 0 0.1 seconds to get the data from Zurich to Amsterdam, through the whole processing pipeline, and then to the browser, which is quite fast. It's at least faster than uh, on the order of hours. Um, so a bit of history. Um, so a colleague of mine uh, did an internal presentation, and it was actually quite funny. So it started in 1999 with this setup. We have this one RC, and we have one RIS server, which is in Amsterdam. So this is quite cute. So in 1999, a full table was uh, 60,000 routes. So this actually fit. Turns out uh, the internet grows. And people figured out, well, yeah, this is not really scaling. And uh, let's do it like this. Um, this is pretty close to uh, the, the um, old style RSCs. So we have the uh, BGP speaker in uh, uh, various locations. And then we uh, rsync the data to uh, Amsterdam. Um, however, people figured out, well, MySQL is not really scaling, so get, let's get rid of this. And so the, the interesting thing of this is if you go to the routing policy work, uh, no, to the, to the routing uh, working group, they had these uh, presentations uh, every year on uh, new developments in RIS. And they were always like, yeah, so we, we thought we had scaling issues worked out. Turns out it's not really scaling, but now we have to better design and this will totally work. And then you had the next uh, year later have the same talk. Uh, so I'm here to, give, to, to tell you this. This time we really have this worked out and I have proof for this uh, because we actually need two slides to um, uh, uh, yeah, show how this stuff works. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, to be able to, to stream data, um, we uh, switched from um, Quagga to ExaBGP. Um, no, hold on, it's better if I show the uh, other slides. So, the uh, old style uh, RCs uh, use uh, Quagga, which has uh, some, some problems. Uh, so, it's, it's a single threaded which is not a good thing on uh, modern CPUs, and it um, locks up during uh, uh, table dumps. So it just sits there and writes a table dump to file and just goes, la, 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 I can't hear you. And, well, that's not good with BGP because then your whole time expires and you drop all the sessions. So better not do that. Um, the other trouble with this is <coughs> it, it kind of streams updates out, 
Um, but to get them as a stream art, it's uh, rather complicated. Um, so yeah, we moved away from, from uh, uh, Quagga. And we're using XABGP, which is uh, still th uh, single-threaded, uh, but it uh, runs event-based, so it does not lock up. Um, also, uh, we can run multiple instances of uh, XIBGP, so it connects out. Uh, you cannot connect in. Well, technically you can, but we're not using that. So we can run an instance uh, per CPU, or even multiple instances per CPU, and then have uh, peerings on those instances. Um, also, it does a much, much simpler job. Uh, it does not have to keep uh, any BGP state. It just does not care. Uh, the only thing it cares about is that it can keep the session alive. So it does the BGP state machine, but after that it just streams out data. And <clears throat> this streaming out is uh, one line of uh, JSON per BGP message, which is writes to standard out. And it uh, forks up a, a, a process uh, that gets this via standard in and that process writes it into a directory queue. And um, so it's set up in a way that if this process dies, then it takes down uh, XIPGP with it, uh, which then tears down your session. Um, which is quite important for uh, um, uh, consistency reasons. <clears throat> Uh, you cannot ever lose a BGP message um, when, when you try to um, uh, um, yeah, collect this data and uh, have consistent state. If you're losing a message, you're losing an update, and then that's not in your, in your routing table. That's bad. Uh, so what we really, really care about is never ever lose a message. So uh, the design is either the message is stored safely on disk, or the session goes down. And if the session goes down, that's also fine, because then you bring it back up and um, you start to fresh. So uh, we have the data on disk on the um, remote uh, RC. And uh, then we have, uh, per directory queue, um, another process which uh, drains this and shoves it uh, from the remote RC uh, to Amsterdam. And uh, currently, uh, um, to, to store it in a, in a queuing system there. And uh, currently, we are using for, uh, that uh, RabbitMQ, which is really, really not performing for us for this. Um, because of the trouble with uh, RabbitMQ, what it tries to do is you, you have one message, uh, which is one BGP message, and you put it in there, and then it comes back to you. Yeah, I have stored this. Um, next trouble is we have a cluster of this, so we need to store it on three machines. So you put the message in, and RabbitMQ goes, oh yeah, yeah, I have this message. I store it here, and I store it over there, and there as well. And then it comes back to you and tells you, yeah, this is done. So you have this RC in, in uh, Johannesburg, uh, which is quite far away. So you have a, a high latency link. So this is not going to perform. Um, so if you're um, bringing up a session, or if you're uh, bouncing a session where you have a full view with uh, 600,000 routes, that more or less comes down to 100,000 messages. Uh, RabbitMQ needs for this uh, 20 minutes to sync up. So we can keep the, the steady state of updates, but if you're restarting a session, uh, then it takes 20 minutes, which is kind of not good. Um, Kafka is uh, much better with this, so we currently run it in parallel. Um, uh, this can just keep up. We don't even know how fast it is, uh, because we, well, we would need to measure it. What, what happens is, uh, so you, you bring up the session, uh, XRPGP slurps in the data, uh, puts it uh, uh, on disk, and then you shove it over to Kafka, and it's just there, there's zero delay. So it uh, depends on your remote BGP speaker, uh, how fast can they give, the, give you the rounds. Uh, reason for that is that um, the, the, the on-wire protocol uh, does compression. This stuff really uh, compresses rather well. And uh, you can shove in multiple messages, and, uh, like 20,000 at a time, and get, then get the acknowledgement. So while you cannot ever lose a message, it's quite okay to duplicate a message. So we shove these 20,000 messages to Amsterdam and then something weird goes on and we can't work out if it's ever arrived there. Well, we don't care, we just shift it there again. Um, because, so if you, you get an update message uh, for this prefix and then you get the very same update again, well, that doesn't mean anything, it's, it's in your route, it's in your routing table. Um, yeah. Um, so there, there was this um, a slide with the how we process this data, and um, well, I mentioned that the, the boss sometimes makes me touch a dupe, and well, yeah, we use a dupe for this. Uh, 
And there are some words about that, and I actually know some of these words. Um, but yeah, it's not really interesting. So we process data. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the last uh, bit of our presentation together is uh, how can you use the uh, RIPE Atlas to measure your reachability? So mandatory introduction, uh, RIPE Atlas is a global open distributed network of a measurement platform that is using uh, hardware probes hosted by volunteers um, that are performing measurements and uh, we collect this uh, measurement data like in real time and then we store it. So it's uh, now five, six years of, of uh, stored data that we have. So I'm going to skip the question about who has heard about RIPE Atlas because apparently everybody in Germany has heard about RIPE Atlas. Again, congratulations. You have the most active probes deployed, more than US. This uh, happened actually this August after IETF because uh, Daniel Karenberg gave an uh, interview at the uh, RFC podcast, and then everybody from Germany requested the probe. And, uh, but then we actually didn't have any. So, like, you all had to wait until we got some more, and then we started shipping them, and then, uh, yeah, now there's, uh, there's a lot of them deployed. Uh, still, if you do want one, uh, I have some with me, so you can find me later in the break. So... Um, I want to mention three things, the trace route, the credits, and the hackathons. So this is the, the first one. So let me tell you a story. Before the RIPE Atlas existed, if some customer contacted you and said, oh, I have problems reaching your servers, then you had to go to the DNOG mailing list or NANOG mailing list and say, hey, guys, can you please try to reach my server? This is the IP address and uh, do the trace route from wherever you are and then send me the output of the trace route so that I can see. And then people would actually send it to the list and everybody would be like, no, no, not to the list, just to him. And so now you don't really have to have friends anymore. You can actually just use RIPE Atlas for that. So with one click in our web interface, you can go there and say, like, do the trace route from 1,000 probes worldwide. And then we are going to... Uh, process the data and uh, show it to you as uh, several visualizations. So this is one of them. Well, uh, it's not really 1,000, but yeah, here it shows like a round trip time latency, color coded. Um, and you can also download that data. Uh, there's an API for that. And um, yeah, you can do your own analysis. We also show them uh, like all these results in a list with some uh, table overview, and then we also have some even more fancy visualizations. This is something called latency mon. So this kind of visualization is available both for the trace route uh, and for pings and for DNS. So it actually groups the probes per country or per AS number and then shows you these stacked graphs so you can see like where and when the problem has occurred. So uh, apart from reachability, you can also see like uh, some, some other problems. And of course, uh, we had to go for the command line tools because a lot of um, users of RIPE Atlas actually prefer this old fashioned typing on the command line. So you can actually do this like RIPE Atlas and then measure, trace route, the number of probes, the, the, where should they come from, and then just get the textual output that you can then process further with, uh, with your other tools. So this is the free software. It's available on GitHub. We accept uh, contributions. And um, there is also, the, this is included in a lot of existing uh, distributions uh, already. So you can install it either from GitHub or it's maybe part of the system that you already use. So um, next topic is um, how is this all paid for? So uh, the usage, usage of RIPE Atlas is not uh, gratis because the system is actually 
uh, billed and paid for by the contributions of either the volunteers who are hosting the probes or the RIPE NCC members. And so those who contribute, they also earn so-called credits. And so in order to perform the measurements, so to take part in the system as, as a user, as a consumer, you have to pay with those credits. So you can earn them by hosting a probe, or if you are a RIPE NCC member, every month you can claim one million credits. And uh, there are other ways. You can also become a sponsor. You can host a different system, which is called RIPE Atlas Anchor, which is a bigger server, and then it earns you more credits. And for the first uh, eight lucky people here in the audience, you can also reclaim the voucher called DNOG8, and then you will also get million credits. So if you log in to RIPE Atlas and go to credits and then reclaim voucher, then uh, you can get a million credits uh, as a present. Also on RIPE Labs, we published an article about what are the other ways, how can you spend credits, how can you earn credits, so you can get more tips there. And finally, if you are a coder and if you like to play around with RIPE Atlas data, measurements, and other implementations of this kind of data, you can join our hackathons. We, we had four in the last two years. Next year, we will probably have another two. Uh, the, the, they're great fun. The awards are also wonderful. It's always, the, always a box of strop waffles um, because apparently it's a Dutch thing. And uh, yeah, I hope I'll see you there at some time. And so this is the end of our talk. So I hope that uh, you have learned how to take part in RIPE Atlas policies, what can you use the RIS for, and uh, a little bit more about RIPE Atlas. Are there any questions? Vesna, this is Wolfgang. I feel old. Oh, <laughs> because, because of course there was something before RIPE Atlas. Oh. It was called the Test Box Project. Yeah, and, but we don't talk about and, that and anymore. It, <laughs> and, it, and it had one feature I really, really liked, and that was the one time latency measurement. Okay. Do I hear that as a feature request? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it back. <laughs> Plus one, <laughs> I see plus one there. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Max. I'm the guy with the IPv6 proposal. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I have a question for the audience. I'd like to have a show of hands within the support of the proposal as it now stands, although the discussion phase uh, was closed some days ago. Okay. Anybody against it and who needs some changes? If so, please come back to me. Haunt me. Speak to me. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions on the talk? I don't see any. So let's thank our speakers. <laughs>